I wanted to share something with you um, as we're ending this year, going into the next year, specifically about Mary and Joseph. Now, we, we really hear about Mary and Joseph just at Christmas time. You know, just because of the, the nativity story, you see the little figurines and images everywhere. Um, but we don't hear about Mary and Joseph really in at the time, really. I mean, it's, it's kind of just a Christmas thing. And so as I was thinking about, you know, what, God, what do you want to say this week? Um, I just happened to be reading through some of the Christmas narrative, just the Christmas story. And all of a sudden, this thought pops into my head. What can we learn from Mary and Joseph in the midst of all this? And so I want to share with you a few things um, about, that we could learn from them that I really think will help us not only as we go into 2021, but as we stand on the precipice of what our purpose is and actually learning how to step into what God's called us to do. Amen. Um, if you'll indulge me some scripture reading, um, we're going to do a little bit of that today um, so that we can kind of catch up on the story. We're going to start off in Luke chapter one. Here's what it says, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man who's name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Have any of you been afraid that God would one day appear to you like that and you'd be scared to death? Okay, so just a quick story. There was a moment at New Covenant Church at our south campus. I had to go to church one day at like 11 p.m. because I forgot something that I had to have for the next morning. You know, it's dark in a church. Anybody ever been to a church sanctuary that's kind of like, that's spooky? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like spiritual stuff be happening here. You know, like, I don't know what's, I don't know if there's some demon like floating around, you know, whatever. Anyway, so I walk in and there was this huge wall. And, and once you get past the wall, it opens up into the sanctuary. And I got to the edge of that wall and I said, Jesus, if you're going to appear to me, it better not be right now. <laughs> okay, so I don't like being scared. So anyway. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, guys. <laughs> Just have one of those moments. Uh, um, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And he shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, uh, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of the Most High, uh, excuse, excuse me, Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Somebody hear that. Nothing will be impossible with God. Say it again in your head. Nothing will be impossible with God. Things are impossible with you. But nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. One more, uh, several more passages, but here's the next one. Luke chapter 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was uh, governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who is with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. A couple more. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 says this Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, uh, uh, before they came together, since she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Um, and her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, revolted to divorce her quietly. Now let me pause right here. They were betrothed. Then why would he have to divorce her? Okay, little context here. In Jewish uh, culture, if you were betrothed, you were considered legally married at your betrothal. Okay. So just a little side note there, because it can be kind of confusing when you read the Bible and it says betrothed. Because for us, betrothed means y'all going to get married. That doesn't mean you might have put a ring on it, but that doesn't mean it's solidified. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so that's kind of what was going on here. Um, they, were, they were technically married. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Whew. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, 
and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Just a couple more. Matthew 2, 13 through 15. Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Last one, Matthew 2, 19 through 23. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to a dream and in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, and he would be called a Nazarene. See, Mary and Joseph had a very specific purpose. Very specific. And that was to get Jesus into the earth. Okay? Um, I remember something John Gray said a long time ago that really meant a lot to my mother. That your parents, your parents, whether they're good, bad, or ugly, whatever it is, their job was to get you to earth. To get you here. And, and, and so when you look at Mary and you look at Joseph, you see what they went through. You see the trouble and the travail that they went through to get Jesus here. We can see clearly that that's exactly what God had called them to do in that moment. Now, Joseph, we, we don't really hear about anything about Joseph after that. And a lot of historians believe that Joseph died while Jesus was still young, definitely before he was 18 years old. Because when, when there was the wedding at Cana, there was absolutely no reference to Joseph. And that was very odd for there not to be a reference to the husband if he were there. At least culturally. So we can easily suspect that, that Joseph probably passed on while Jesus was, was still pretty young. But Mary, like when you look at, at the course of Mary's life, I mean, go read about Mary. And you don't really see anything else huge happening with Mary. She's kind of a footnote to every other story. Why? It's because her purpose was to get Jesus here and get him to his purpose. Okay? Now... Whether or not your parents have been engaged like Mary was to get you to your purpose, I want you to know something. That your heavenly father has been actively engaged in getting you to your purpose. Okay? You don't have to have your mom and dad present in order to reach your potential. Now, do they help? Absolutely. Like God built the family unit specifically to help you get to your purpose. But, but like God showed me when I wrote the book on the orphan spirit, he said, you've got three fathers. You've got your earthly father, you've got your spiritual father, and you've got your heavenly father. And when, you're, when your earthly father fails you, you have spiritual fathers you can lean on. And when both of those fail you, you have me to lean on. I asked my father one day, how in the world could you be such a good dad when your own dad died when you were 10 years old? He, he wasn't that, I mean, he, he wasn't the nice Christian man that you would expect. But my dad is an awesome dad. How? And he said, boy, I had a dad. God was my dad. So I want to encourage you right now. If you don't have the perfect nuclear family in your history, don't be worried about getting to your purpose. God doesn't need your family to get you there. He just needed your family to get you here. He needed your mom and dad to get you on the earth. So don't, don't stress about your family and how your mom and dad may not have been so supportive of where you are and what you're doing. You have a heavenly father. They also had excruciating circumstances that they had to face in the midst of one of the three most important events in human history. So what can we learn from Mary and Joseph today that will help us step as gracefully into our purpose as they stepped into theirs? Now, we can look at this passage of Scripture and think, boy, they just, oh, yes, God, whatever you want me to do. And they went about it, right? There was travail. There was, do you think that Joseph might have had some questions? Of course he did. But let's talk about, I'm going to give you three things that we can learn and then three ways that we can actually do the thing we just learned. Can I give you that? I'll give you some theory and give you some practical, okay? So here's the first one. It's going to require total obedience. Whatever God has for you, it's going to require total obedience, okay? Um, They didn't necessarily give God a list of reasons why it wouldn't work. At least we don't see that in the Bible. Now, Joseph may have had his moments, but you know, the Bible says that he was asleep and that when he woke up, he did it. 
So maybe Joseph was able to work out in his sleep the questions that he had for God. Or maybe he just believed God. And so you're going to face a moment when you're dealing with your specific purpose. Where you've got to make a decision on whether or not you just believe God or not. Whether you trust him or not. They just did it. Moses gave God a list of reasons why he couldn't do what he was called to do. Y'all remember this? He was at the burning bush. Well, God, 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 I don't, I don't talk, 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 talk that, that good. Like, that's what Moses said to God. Okay? And I want you to know something. This is, this is, well, I'll have to unpack this in a whole different series. But when Moses said that to God, what happened is the priesthood and the kingship separated. Moses became the acting king and Aaron became the acting priest. It was reunited in the form of David. When David came on, he was a priest king. Why? Because it was a relationship with God. And then the time when the priesthood and the kingship came back together permanently was when Jesus Christ came on the scene. So here's my theory. Is that the priesthood and the kingdom should have never been separated to begin with. That God wanted Moses to walk in both of those roles at the same time. To step into a level of power that nobody's ever even considered before. In fact, that's what he wanted with Adam. Remember, he gave Adam not just kingship, but the priesthood as well. You see what I'm saying? So Jesus fixed it. And now all of a sudden, we're not just kings. We're not just priests. We're priests and kings in the kingdom. Because we mimic Jesus. It's amazing. But what they didn't do is give him a big list of things why they couldn't do stuff. Mary said one thing. She said, how can that happen since I've not known a man? That's a reasonable question. That's not saying, God, I can't do that because of this. That's saying, how are you going to do that in me? It's, listen, it's okay to have some questions like that. But here's what you need to be sure you don't do. Don't stand there in opposition to the purpose when you don't see how it's going to work out. When you stand in opposition to the purpose that God has for you, what you're telling God is not only do I not understand it, I don't even know if I'm down with this. So don't do that. Proverbs 3, 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your understanding. Y'all, our understanding is like this compared to what God knows. In fact, we don't know nothing. Nothing at all. It'd be like asking a two-year-old about like quantum physics. They don't know jack. All right? That's how we are when it comes to it. And here's what I love. Don't lean on your own understanding. Have you ever seen somebody lean on a wall? Like, you ever see, I heard the phrase, if you can lean, you can clean, right? I love that. It's so funny to me. Uh, but, but when you're leaning on a wall, it's amazing to me that you can't take a step until you reorient yourself. Like, think about just naturally. Like, if I had somebody right now, Monique, you want to lean on a wall? Okay, I won't make you do it. If you lean on a wall, <laughs> you would have to reorient yourself back up to normal before you really take an effective step. To me, that's insane. Because when we lean on our understanding, we're incapable of taking a step. Y'all hear that? When you, when you are stuck in what you have the ability to understand, you can't take a step. Not unless you know the outcome. But with, with the Lord, when we trust in the Lord, that is Him realigning ourselves to what His purpose and His plan is. And it allows us to take that step. Your yes comes easier when your heart trusts the one who's asking. Okay? So, when it comes to requiring total obedience, the question you need to ask yourself is simply this. Do I really trust God? Do I really trust Him? The second thing is this. It's going to be the hardest thing you ever do. I want you to pick a random character in the Bible, just one. And I want you to think for a second about the struggles that they face. Not a single person in the Bible had it easy. Not a one. Now, some of them were, some of it was self-inflicted. Some of it was, was just secondary results. But nobody had just this easy walk through the park when it came to their Christianity. Mary and Joseph had struggles. They had fear of what others would think. How can you be a pregnant virgin in first century, first century Judea? Do you know what being a pregnant virgin meant? It means you got stoned out in the back quarter. That's what it meant. Right. It means death. What about fear of telling your betrothed, I'm pregnant? I mean, you know, like, can you, I mean, you ladies can obviously imagine this more than us men can. But, like, can you imagine going to your fiancé and saying, I'm pregnant, but I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't done that. I wasn't doing that. I'm just I'm pregnant. I don't know how. 
I mean, what would the fiance? Well, listen, I'm a man of, I'm a just man, and I want to, you know, divorce you quietly. That ain't what you would be saying, guys. You'd be like, oh, no, uh uh-uh, you know, like, (laughs) you'd be going to the pawn shop to trade that ring for a gun or something, because you know you need another pistol, because every East Texas man needs a pistol, but, uh, (laughs) but what about this? What about the fact that before Mary even had to go say something, Jesus had already made a way for Joseph? Like, man, it's, so like what encouragement can we take from that? That you may be in a hard situation. This may be hard, but God already has a plan that's going to meet you in the middle of that hard thing and make it bearable. In fact, God gives you hard things. And this is amazing. You want to know another reason why God loves you or how God loves you is God will give you a hard thing, but then he'll say, give it to me so you can carry my light thing. He'll trade yokes with you. If you're walking in line with him, the Bible says, how can two walk together unless they agree? The only way Jesus will carry your yoke is if you are walking with him. Hmm. She was traveling pregnant. Ladies, y'all been pregnant before, like traveling. How y'all like even a bump in a car? Y'all be like, don't you hit the bump? I will throw up everywhere. Right. Like there there are times when people are having that have to be bedridden. Right. When it comes to pregnancy. Um, What about what about birthing a kid in an animal shed? Any y'all down with that? You know, it, like hay everywhere? I mean, maybe it's happened. Um, what about dodging a murder plot against your son? Meanwhile, all the kids two years and under are being slaughtered around you. That's got to be pretty tough. How about this? The pressure of knowing that you are responsible for the savior of mankind. Any pressure there? What about losing him in the temple? Some of y'all are like, I've been trying to lose this little kid for three years. Like, <laughs> y'all need Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Um, you, you may have lost your little kid in Walmart for a few minutes, but was he the savior of mankind? God, I asked you to do one thing, Mary, just one thing, right? What about being his mom and seeing the hatred that so many people have for your son? What about seeing him beat until he was unrecognizable? What about seeing him mocked and ridiculed and then nailed to a cross? Y'all, Mary and Joseph didn't have it easy. And we could talk about them stepping into their purpose gracefully, but y'all, it was hard. It was difficult. See, you are going to experience struggles in your calling. They're going to be brutal and they're going to be heart wrenching, they're going to be terrifying. You're going to get fought spiritually. And those spiritual fights are oftentimes going to spill out into the natural. The first time I spoke at New Covenant Church, the the week before, my son stopped breathing. Had meningitis, had to rush to the hospital. He was in the hospital for a week, almost died. Literally was laying lifeless in my wife's arms. Why that week of all weeks? Why that one? I'll tell you why. Because there are times when the spiritual fight will tear into the natural realm. You're going to have hard moments, guys. Moments that are going to be very, very difficult. But let me share the last point with you here. The last thing is that it is worth the effort. Come on. It's worth the effort. It's worth it. It's worth the pain. It's worth the struggle. It's worth the hurt. It's worth it all. In this life, you are going to experience pain. There is a difference, though, between temporary pain and chronic pain. Temporary pain is like when you're riding a bike up a hill and you feel your muscles getting bigger and you're working out or you're running or you feel your muscles growing. But chronic pain is debilitating. And I want you to know something, that temporary pain is the evidence of process, but chronic pain is the evidence of a problem. And so if there's chronic pain in your life right now, I want you to know something. You better talk to somebody. Don't be walking around just uh, because your purpose needs you healthy and whole. It needs you healthy. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think it just needs you spiritually healthy. I've been I've really, really had to take some some inventory on my own life and my own physical health. I told the guys at group one night at our men's group, like, y'all go get checked out. You know, oh, I don't, ain't nothing wrong with me. No, you take your rear end to the doctor and get a physical for crying out loud. 
Like, are you will, really willing to risk years of your life for your ego? Come on now. You know, it's like we joke and laugh about Christmas, like Little Debbie Christmas trees all the time. We need to stop eating Little Debbie, guys. Okay? I know I'm getting curses from the back, but you need to stop. I mean, every now and then, that's fine, but everything in moderation right now. Moderation doesn't mean just like chain eating little Debbies either. Guys, we, we, need, we need to be healthy spiritually. We need to be healthy physically because this life we have to live, we cannot live it with chronic pain. Let me tell you something, church. You cannot live it with chronic spiritual pain. Yes, spiritual pain means unforgiveness in your heart. Spiritual pain means dealing with the hurts that you've experienced over the course of your life. You cannot carry that stuff around anymore. Because if you do, it's not just debilitating to you. It means your purpose cannot be realized. You cannot allow the pain that you've experienced in your past, no matter how real it is, to destroy your future. You can't. I'm not saying you're not going to have pain, that you're not going to have struggle. But I want you to know something. Not only is it worth it, but God always makes a way for it. When you can't understand it. If I forgive them, what am I going to do with all my anger? God will take every ounce of it and turn it to compassion for the people you spent your whole life hating. It's the truth. And I don't know how he does it. I don't know if he's got a little wand or something or if he just says, let there be, and it's just gone. But, but the moment I decided to forgive the person that hurt me the most in my life, the very next emotion I felt was compassion for that person. Yes. Couldn't explain it. Explain it. So, you need to embrace temporary pain. But you need to ask for help with the chronic pain. Now listen to me. What do I mean by embrace temporary pain? Know, here's what I mean. Is know that the pain you're experiencing is a part of your growth process. Instead of saying, God, why the pain? Say, God, what are you showing me? What are you telling me right now? What do I need to learn? What needs to be worked out inside of me that you don't like for my purpose? Is, is, there, a, is there a cog in the wheel that's going to keep my purpose from turning that you need to get out before I can become who you call me to be? Show it to me. That's temporary pain. But chronic pain is a tool of the enemy designed to keep you not in your purpose. You know, a mother who's given birth remembers the pain, but they know the pain was worth it. While that pain is excruciating, it's only temporary. All of the expectation over the course of the last nine months is coming to a moment of fruition when the mother holds her child for the first time. I remember seeing Monique hold Vivi for the first time. And, and I don't know what pain she experienced. It was, it, it was extensive because I was there. I mean, I didn't feel it, but <laughs> baby, you went through some stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I remember my own love for my wife went from here to like, boom, like it was exponential. And it's one of the things I love telling uh, couples like when I do their wedding. I was like, you think you love your spouse right now. You think you love them right now. And you do. But let them have, you know, let y'all have the first kid or something like that. And it's just like, you know what I'm talking about if you got kids. But when a mother holds that baby for the first time, that expectation, the hope of what that baby might be, who it will become, the pain is worth it in that moment. It's worth it. So in the same way, the struggle that gets you to your purpose is worth the effort. Let me, let me tell you this, and this, is, this might be painful to hear, but the only pain worse than birthing your purpose is the pain that comes when you've missed it. Oh my God. Let me say it again. The only pain worse than birthing your purpose is the pain that comes when you've missed it. It's a simple cost-benefit analysis for you business minds out there. You can either have the pain that comes with the birth, or you can have pain that comes with the loss. I want you to have, I want you to experience the worth it. I want you to experience pain because I know that that pain leads to a moment where you say, aha, that's what you were doing. Here's what I, here's what I find, that the pain that we experience, the struggle and the suffering that we experience, that I oftentimes believe that God has that pain at a minimum for us. But because of our reaction to the situation, we actually exacerbate the problem and create more pain in our lives because we're mishandling what he was intended for us in the first place. Does that make sense? 
And so we've got to have a better understanding of what pain is there for in the first place. It's designed to help you become everything God's called you to be. So when it comes to all this, I'm just going to call all of this we just talked about the it. All right. What do we do with it? What do we do with all this? What do we do with the fact that pain's going to be there and that it's going to be the hardest thing? And <clears throat> what do we do with knowing that it's worth it? Well, here's three quick things. Number one, be willing. Just be willing. Your, your butt reveals your level of trust. Okay, here's what I mean. God, I'm happy to go with you, but... Yes, yes God, I'm, I'm in, but can you make sure... Here's something you remember. There's no room for a caveat in real Christianity. No room for it. There are no caveats in real Christianity. Well, God, I'm all in as long as... Yada, yada, yada. There's no room for that. Here's why. Because caveats are faithless, and all they do is leave room for a back door. So, if you were, if you were in a situation right now where you know God wants you to do something, but you've had a really, really hard time saying yes to that, here's what I want you to do. Stop trying to say yes and start closing back doors. Okay? So, find those back door moments and close them. Don't give yourself an opportunity to leave out the back door. Make it where the only option you have is to say yes to Jesus. Okay? Uh, the second one is be wise. Chasing your heart is foolishness. It is so dumb to chase your heart. Your heart is fickle as it can be. Don't chase that. Trusting in Jesus, though, is wisdom. You have to be wise enough to know when you are chasing after your own heart and when you're chasing after his promise. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, it starts with you. Where are you with Jesus right now? If you're not just chasing after the relationship to begin with, forget the purpose side. Like, just don't even worry about the purpose side yet. That's, you've got to chase after Jesus first. That's what you need to be doing. Um, and the second part is um, you need older wisdom. Let me explain what I mean. Um, you know, they say that Mary was around the age of 14 when all of this went down. Okay, so... When you look at the list of things that they went to, now add that you're 14. Okay, scientifically, your frontal lobe isn't even developed enough to make good decisions yet. Now, one of the reasons why they say Joseph died earlier is because he was older, much older. Like maybe even around in his 40s. Already had kids. That's what some, of them, that's what some theologians say. I don't know about the kids part, but he, he was definitely older. Definitely was. But Mary didn't run to her little 14-year-old friends and say, what do I do? I'm pregnant. Y'all, that'd have been all over Nazareth like this here. You know what I'm saying? Like, they'd have been that, 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 that Morse code back then, you know? Like, tapping on the wall of the shit or whatever it was. And, uh, yeah, pigeons. I guess they had pigeons back then. Or Quick, tied onto a goat. You know? <laughs> Who did she go to? Mary went to Elizabeth. Older, wiser, more experienced. And here's how much I love this. It's just, oh my is that not only, not only did Mary go to older, wiser, more experienced, she went to older, wiser, more experienced in her same situation. Exactly. Yeah. Yo, hear that. Why in the world did God allow Elizabeth to be with child in that specific moment? Did Jesus Christ really need John the Baptist announcing the way? I think there was some part of some scriptural fulfillment that went on there. But what if God put... John and Elizabeth's belly just so that Mary could be comforted. So here's the question that kind of takeaway for us is what has God birthed in somebody else around you that is only there so that you can be encouraged? Experience is the space between the questions we have and the answers we want. So if you really want to know the answer to whatever question you have right now, I'm not saying don't go to your peers. Sure, but if you want the wisdom that comes with older and experienced, go to somebody who's wise, old, and experienced. Now, raise your hand if you're old. <laughs> uh, that's funny. All right, nobody. All right, great. <clears throat> this is a part of why being a member of a church is so important. Okay? Um, it's not just for the fellowship. I mean, we can, have all the, we can have all the little casserole dinners we wanted to. We can eat as many Christmas trees together as we want to. But 
there are going to be moments in your life when you're going to have to ask a question that's outside of your little sphere of friends. You need somebody in the church you can go to and say, hey, listen, I need some help with this. You know, and I know people don't like to, oh, I'm old. No, I forget all that. You know what? Gray hair doesn't mean you're old. It means you've got some wisdom under your belt. And so don't be afraid or don't be off put when a younger person comes to you and says, hey, you've got experience. Can you help me with this? You know, I had a moment, just a gut check moment in my heart this past week. I had a pastor friend call me, was experiencing some real issues and some real struggles. He's, um, he's about 11 or 12 years younger than me. And um, he was just telling me about some struggles and they were pretty serious. And he was really, really just exhausted with some things. And he said, um, um, I was just thinking, man, this guy really needs to be encouraged. So I said, hey, I would love to connect you with this guy that's a part of my next level group named David. He's got a big church out in Arizona. You know, he's experienced a lot of the stuff kind of that you're going on, you know. And, and then I started thinking, you know, I just don't know if that could happen or not. And I told him that. I was like, I don't know if that could happen or not. Uh, and, and I was just wanting him to be encouraged. That's all I wanted. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you do it. But see, I'm still 18 in my brain. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, what, what wisdom and experience do I have? And then the Holy Spirit said again, why are you discounting? 20 years of ministry, dude. You've been in this thing for 20 years. Like, I'm, I'm not, so, my wife calls me old nonstop. But I'm not some, I'm not 400 years old. But I've lived through some stuff. I've experienced some things in church. So I just began to encourage this guy. It, I hope it helped. But it's like, you got to get to a place where you say, okay, when somebody comes to you, you do it. You encourage them. Build them up. Speak life in them. And here's the last thing is this. You got to recognize. You just got to recognize. Have you ever done something for someone, but they didn't recognize it? Uh, when you don't recognize what's going on, you miss the blessing. So don't miss it. Luke 2, 18 and 19 says this. And all who heard it wondered what the shepherds told them. This is when the shepherds came. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Now, they say all of those who heard it. Well, who was in the room? The shepherds? Jesus? Mary? Mary? And Joseph, for all we knew, I mean, at least that's what the Bible record shows. And so one didn't recognize, but one did. Be a Mary in this situation where you learn to recognize these moments, these purpose moments where God is unpacking his promise. Okay, these moments, they don't necessarily happen every single day. But when they do happen... You've got to be wise enough to recognize that this is a moment where God is unpacking something. And so what you do is you just take note of it. You treasure it in your heart. Because there's going to be a moment later on where you're going through something really difficult. And you're going to remember what the shepherd said. You've got to have those moments, okay? So God is going to ask you to do some things that require your utmost obedience. Okay? He's going to ask you to do some things that are hard, that you don't know how to do. And you have, no, you have absolutely no clue how in the world you're going to make it. Okay? And I know that obedience and suffering are not just two things that people just are so excited to jump at. Like that's not the fun stuff that we like to do. But here's the deal. Our flesh is conditioned to rebel. And our flesh is conditioned to seek the least resistance possible. That's what our flesh is expecting to do. Our spirits operate differently. Our spirits operate very differently. So we've got to be sure that we are not subject to our flesh and we actually walk in the spirit. God knows what the product of obedience and suffering is. He knows that if you can surrender your will and kill your flesh, that heaven is what waits on the other side. I'm not talking about the pearly gates whenever you die. I'm talking about heaven now. Your purpose now. The kingdom being moved forward is what waits on the other side of that. God knows it's worth it. So, what do we do with this? We need to just say two things to the Lord today. The first one is this. God, whatever you want. Yes. It's a yes for me, Lord. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. God, help me recognize what you're doing. You know, when we first launched Freedom Church, I started out talking about this new thing God was doing. Would you recognize it? It's, it's not our job to do the new thing. It's our job to recognize it. Okay? So here's what I'm asking you to do, church, today. If you would just take a moment and bow your heads. I want you to just get with the Lord for a second. 
And there is something God's asking you to do. Now, it may not be your overall life's purpose, but there's something right now God is asking you to do, and you know exactly what it is. He's been speaking into your heart, and you've kind of been fighting with him on it. You've kind of been like trying to convince him otherwise. or convince. Him. There's always something inside of us. Here's what I'm asking you today. Will you just give God your yes today? God, whatever you want. Yes, it's a yes. I know it's going to be hard. I know I'm going to have to kill some flesh. I know I have to make some decisions and that are eventually going to cut some people maybe out of my life even. But God, it's a yes. It's a yes. And then secondly, just like Elisha prayed for his servant, that God would open his eyes. Would, would you just ask God to help you recognize right now exactly what he's doing? Just help me recognize it, Father. I don't want to have fleshly vision. I want to have spiritual vision. God, I pray for these people right now. And God, I know there's so much we can learn from Mary and Joseph. And I know that, God, you ask us to do things that are just crazy sometimes. If I can just be honest with you, man, they're crazy sometimes. But God, I'm so thankful that you don't ask us to do anything alone. That you're always with us. And God, when we can't bear the burden, you take the weight. God, when we can't take the punches, you take them. God, when we can't do it, you step in. When we don't have enough, you pour enough into us. When we don't have the grace for this moment, you pour it out, Father. So I'm just asking you, God, to show us. Help us recognize what you're doing. And God, let us end 2020 and start 2020 in the same way. And that's simply this. Whatever you want, whenever you want with whoever you want, and however you want. It's yes from me. It's a yes. We thank you for it, Jesus. We love you. God, I'm willing to say right now, I thank you for this year. It's been crazy and wacky and hard and difficult, but I thank you for the temporary pain because I know heaven is waiting on the other side. We love you, Jesus, and it's your name I pray. Amen. Amen.